Hi, and welcome back to our reading of uh, The Red Line by Maria Seppes. We uh, last time finished book one in the book, and uh, we are about to start the second book, The Crucible in the Fire. Makes you wonder if that's what we're going through on planet Earth right now. So, um, it will start with chapter 19, Louis de la Tourzelle. So, second book, Crucible in the Fire. Starts with a quote from an Orphic fragment. How those who are poured forth from the great world soul revolves through the universe, seeking one another. They fall from planet to planet, and from the depths they cry for their lost home. These are your tears, O Dionysus. O great spirit, divine liberator, restore your daughters again to the joy of your light. So that was an Orphic fragment to start book two. And chapter 19, Louis de la Tourzelle. My next rebirth occurred at the beginning of the 18th century and took place as a result of my encounter with Marietta in the midst of unusual and complicated circumstances. It was five years after my death in 1695 before I could connect with a viable body. My repeated efforts caused a great deal of trouble to the woman who finally brought me into the world and cared for me until her mind became completely deranged. This unfortunate woman aborted three times and gave birth to a stillborn child once before I finally came to stay, much to her concern. She was a creature of a thousand fears and premonitions, and she continued to struggle in their net until finally her mind gave way. We lived in a dusty, placid French town called Varennes, which later became famous through the abortive flight of Louis XVI. My grandfather, David Pétion, whom I never knew, had grown up just outside the town. He was the illegitimate son of a nobleman and a clerk's daughter, and in that case conscious time, this meant total social exclusion. He had no family connections and was soon made all too aware of his anomalous status. The peasants considered him an outsider and the nobility would have nothing to do with him. Pétion was a cunning, selfish and ingenious man, he realized that he had to choose one position or the other if he wished to make a place for himself in the world. The fact that he lived in the country awakened his ancestral feeling for the soil. He loved and understood the most blessed and difficult occupation of tending it. In the meantime, his mother had made an advantageous marriage and she was able to give him a respectable sum of money when he came of age. By now, he had made his choice. He would be a peasant. But still, he was well aware that his father's position could bring him many privileges. If, for example, his father legitimized him, there would be no limit to the amount of land he could acquire. So he began a merciless fight to force his father to legitimize him. His father was in a precarious position, being heavily dependent on his marriage, and the son threatened and blackmailed him until he acceded to the demand, on the condition that the boy never use the name and title publicly. To this, David Pétion agreed. The young man bought a small estate in Varennes and managed it well. His wealth grew steadily, if not always ethically. Pétion was an eccentric and selfish misanthrope who took a special delight in making a profit from the financial difficulties of some noblemen. He was quick to send such problems out, and in this way he acquired a lumber mill and a dairy farm, among other things. Being a nobleman's son exempted him from the various taxes which were even then driving the peasantry into a ferment of rebellion. Hundreds were leaving their homes, villages, and land 
to live from hand to mouth as poachers, smugglers, or beggars. The third class was perishing irretrievably under the burden of feudal and state taxes they had been forced to carry alone. But David Pétion throve. He married twice, and my mother was the child of the second marriage. She was sickly and imaginative, and her father didn't care anything about her. His second marriage had been contracted wholly for profit. His wife brought a rich dowry. To judge by her portrait, that was the only way anyone would have had her. The year my mother, Sophie Pétion, turned 18, Louis de la Trozelle came to Varennes to live with relatives. This was a highly expedient move, for he had piled up huge debts in Paris and became involved in a sordid gambling scandal. It was generally believed that he escaped with mere banishment only because he was distantly related to the influential Soubi family. Certainly, he brought no baggage but the romantic velvet cloak, silk suit, lace frills, and silver buckled shoes he was wearing. He was a big burden on his relatives, as the atmosphere of Varennes was on him. He had a reputation for vice, and the neighboring landowners rejected him for the sake of their wives' and daughters' virtue. His uncle and aunt told him plainly that they would provide him food and lodging, but preferred to be without his company. The result was that the lanky, hook-nosed playboy, who had already worn himself out in the debauchery, spent most of his time at the Good Ruler Tavern, where he played cards with traveling horse traders and the local merchants. He won with suspicious frequency. Whatever others might have thought, de la Tourzelle considered his banishment to Varennes simply as a passing accident, the result of the intrigues of his enemies. He told everyone who would listen all about his life in Paris, how much money he had spent, how many duels he had fought, and who his mistresses had been. He talked about everything in the world except the affair that had brought him to Varennes. He was a cocky, loud-mouthed man, sensuous as a satyr, and the women were crazy about him. Men invariably despised him. Very few peasant girls or women escaped his advances, and the fame of his violence spread along with that of his sensuality. Many were secretly thrilled. Sentimental, nervous Sophie Pétion, completely alone since her mother's death, was attracted to the pale, banished nobleman like a moth to flame. She was a slim, blonde girl then with unusually large and well-rounded breasts over a waspy waist. Her chin was graceful and heart-shaped, and she had high Slavic cheekbones and dark, slanting eyes, eyes that shone with overwrought sensuality. It was inevitable that these two derelict passions should meet head-on and burst the dam of convention. Sophie glowed like a torch, stooping joyously under the sultry yoke of love. Even Tourzel's fickle fancy was caught for a while by her unconditional abandon. She submitted to all his perversities with innocence and ecstatic docility. You're quite a woman, Sophie, Tourzel laughed one day as he lay sated beside her. Even Madame Perrault's institute can't produce a lover like you. Sophie apprehensively asked what kind of institute Madame Perrault had. And uh, Tourzel explained insolently that it was Madame's business to teach the most beautiful and distinguished women in Paris how to be good wives. In a few months, Sophie was pregnant, a brutal fact that changed everything. Suddenly, she became frighteningly aware of the danger of her actions, and the alien strength passion had lent to her will vanished like mist. Again, she was weak and timid, restrained by the prejudices of her upbringing and the morals of a small town. And by these, she judged herself guilty indeed. She lost weight and her skin grew yellow and blotchy. Her eyes were always swollen, 
for she cried secretly at night. She no longer met Torzel with lustful kisses when they rendezvoused among the trees or in the hut of some bribed ranger. Now she met him with wild outbursts of reproach and demand. Torzel responded by being harsh and rude. Then he stopped seeing her altogether. Sophie was stunned by the extent of her dilemma, and she wanted to commit suicide. Her plan was to go back to the rendezvous in the forest where she had first learned the sin and stab herself with Tuzel's dagger, which she had managed to confiscate during one of their quarrels. But then she wanted to say goodbye to somebody. At first she thought of her confessor, but she could already see his look of condemning scorn and she did not have the courage to face it. It was only then that she thought of her father, the reserved mister she only saw on Sundays when he walked silently with her to Mass. After all, he was her father, the only person in the world to whom she had any tie. So she went to her father's side of the house, yearning for a little love. Old Pétion's rooms were as isolated from the rest of the house as though they were on an alien planet, and Sophie could never recall having been there before. She had learned early in life that she was neither expected nor tolerated there, and she had not tried to force the issue while she was living in her pleasant dream fog. But now she needed him. She wouldn't tell him what it was all about, of course. She would just go speak to him, say something nice. Then she would ask if he needed anything, and if he would care about her a little, since she was very lonely. But, no, that sounded like an accusation and would make him angry. She just promised to be a good daughter and tell him that she loved him even if she had never shown it. Of course, it was easier to imagine these things than to say them, especially to someone who had never done anything for her but beget her. And how could you talk of affection? to someone with small, narrowed eyes and reproving lips. The stale pipe smoke, awakening so many memories of childhood fears and rejections, almost made her turn back, but she kept on resolutely. It was getting dark, and the old man had not yet lit the lamp. He thought every drop of oil he saved would turn into money. The room she entered, looked like a large and disorderly workshop, for the old man repaired his own furniture, tools, and saddles. He even resold his own boots. Since he never threw anything away, crates, boxes, broken bits of things, and crucibles of evil-smelling glue were scattered all over the room. When Sophie timidly opened the door, her father was sitting in his straight-backed chair, Beside a cold fireplace, the room was almost totally dark, for the tiny window let in very little of the pearl-gray sunset. Sophie stepped closer to the motionless figure. Fear made a lump in her throat, and she had to try several times before she could falter. Good evening, father. There was no answer. She was about to leave, relieved that she did not have to face his probable rejection. He was asleep. Then the presence of death coiled itself about her like a slimy serpent. Possibly, probably, old Pétion, petrified in his selfishness, would have rejected Sophie's pathetic appeal. But the girl was tormented by a terrible enemy, the implacable other in her that could never recriminate enough. After Pétion's death, the nervous, unhappy creature became convinced she had committed an, ir an irreparable wrong. She virtually beatified her father to degrade herself further, berating herself for not having approached him sooner. He had probably been lonesome, longing for love. 
if he had lived in a pig pen, it had only been so that she could have more. And she, ungrateful and debauched woman, had been rolling around with her lover while some hidden disease killed her father. Who knew what he must have suffered there all alone? He had had no one to call to bring him water or to call a priest. Perhaps he was damned because she hadn't been there. So Sophie fasted and prayed paid for masses and performed penances in hysterical spasms of remorse. Meanwhile, it was discovered that old Pétion's fortune was much larger than anyone had thought. A tremendous amount of money was found under the floor in a chest. The old man had not trusted either banks or paper money. His treasure was a shower of gold coins like a fairy tale. Suddenly the world changed around Sophie, his sole heir. Even the young noblemen nearby suddenly found it was not beneath their dignity to ask for the hand of the dazed and awkward girl. Moreover, there were rumors about Pétion's background that made them hope a thorough search might reveal a title to go with the gold. Tourzel heard too and realized his time had come. He came a few weeks after the funeral and took charge as though he were already a member of the family. Sophie, flustered by the crowd of events, cried and protested his presence, but the cynical fawn conquered her yet again. Why are you acting so silly? he asked the sobbing girl when it was over. You've always complained that I wouldn't marry you after getting you pregnant. Now I'm perfectly willing to make you Madame de la Tourzelle, and you act like you don't want the honor. Oh yes, now you will marry me. Sophie wailed. For money! Um, but a nobleman can listen only to his art, my dear. I am fortunate in finding a girl suitable both to my art and my position. And remember, the child will be born in a few months. You want it to have a name. If we marry within the week, it will be considered merely a premature birth. Your pregnancy is beginning to show and no decent man would marry in that condition. If he did, it'd be a contemptuous of you for the rest of your life. At least I love you, Sophie. And here an evil grin crossed his features. I have proof that I was your first lover and the child is mine. This was the background of my mother's marriage. She told me the whole thing in clinical detail as a means of doing penance. Poor woman, she was already half mad then. So Sophie became Madame de la Tourzelle. She was disillusioned with her husband and hated her weakness, but she was still drawn by craven sensuality. And their life together, if you could call it that, gave her nothing but worry, jealousy and regret. Everything she had feared about Tourzelle turned out to be true. He left for Paris just a few days after the wedding, paid off his debts with Pétion's money, rented a palace, bought a carriage, and used it for occasional visits to Varennes. He never offered to take Sophie to Paris, and when she hinted at it, he insisted it was impossible because of her condition. It's because of my condition. I want you to stay a while, Sophie would beg. Here I am alone in this empty house, and sometimes I, I, I have bad days. You must understand, my position, my dear, Tourzel would reply calmly. My pride won't let me live on your money. Now that my affairs are in order, I may be able to get a position worthy of my station. I'll have to attend court constantly to secure one. You must understand, was the refrain of all of Tourzel's visits to Varennes, and soon he forgot to bother with the my dear. The only reason he came at all was the humiliating fact that he still needed Sophie's signature to borrow large sums of money. Of course, the much-touted position was always just within reach. Tourzel was in hourly expectation of being appointed to a high position for years. And, of course, to get it, he must circulate in the courts, the gambling halls and the distinguished parlors of Paris' hot social bloodstream. Sophie miscarried in her fourth month of pregnancy and sent a mounted message to inform Tourzel. 
He regretted that he could not come. He must not risk missing an important tra traveling personage on whom their joint future might depend. He turned up six weeks later and impregnated the still recovering woman yet again. Then, in the course of after-dinner dalliance, he coaxed a large sum of money from her and left. And what had happened to the important personage who had kept him from the sickbed of his wife? As it happened, they had missed each other, and by the time Tozel had tracked him down, someone else had the position. But it didn't really matter, for he had a prospect for an even better position. He was always talking about his supporters and how well they thought of him, and he told Sophie of all the untiring hands that moved here and there about his affairs. Of course, these hands needed constant greasing. That was why he had to stay in Paris and have plenty of money. But as soon as he got his position, he would bring Sophie to Paris and present her in court. After all, he would need to manage a big house, and he couldn't do that without her. But in the meantime, there was no sense in her being with him, because he had to be on the go from morning till night. Often he would visit some lord on his estate and promote his affairs amid the friendly atmosphere of the dinner table with fine wines and spicy stories. He would drop so many names and titles that poor Sophie's head would spin, then repeat his refrain. You must understand. In a few years, Sophie indeed understood. My father died when I was ten years old. He died as he had lived involved in a whorehouse brawl. Several of his companions were suspected, and the lengthy investigation revealed only the facts of Tozel's filthy life and the fact that no one person could be charged with the deed. Everyone involved had been paralytic drunk, and the knife had been Tozel's own. Others had also been wounded in the affair, it all started over a girl named Lolette, who had recently come to the house. Torzel had monopolized her, as was his custom with new flesh, and he had taken offense when other patrons wanted a share of the public treasure. So the estates general condemned the whole lot to the galleys for life. They were all black sheep of noble families. It was a brash fate, but it was the only way to save them from their own depravity. Their bodies might perish, but their souls would have a chance at new life. I had never seen my father except during his brief visits to Varennes, but the ravages of his debauched life were very evident to me. He always came with a hangover and poured out on us all the rancor of his evil disposition. A little drink would quickly make him cheerful, but by nightfall he was always in a foul temper again. He couldn't have lived long, even if he hadn't been murdered, for both his nerves and his digestive system were shot. My mother always considered these visits a merited punishment. She never grumbled or complained, but she never gave him as much money as he asked for either, despite his threats. That money is for your son. He's not going to be a beggar just because you're a drunken bum. You dare say that to me? To me! You could hear him all over the house. Then I would have to control my nausea as I listened to the sound of blows in the other room. There never were any screams. My mother bore it all in silence. Shortly she would come out with a quiet frozen face and take my hand. Come. Come. Finally, I tremblingly planted my small body in front of her and interrupted. He beats you. I heard him. I don't want him to beat you. I want to kill him. Her face broke. You, you're like a little old man. Throw him out, I insisted. He's nothing to do with us. Yes, yes, I'll make him leave. That's what I intend to do. She led me into her bedroom, pulled the marble-topped washstand away from the niche where she kept her money and counted out a sum so he would leave us in peace. Of course, 
There was a special ceremony for this withdrawal. She was a superstitious woman, and her superstitions ruled her life. She had a certain way to get out of bed, a particular shoe to put on first, and a rule about what hand to put on the doorknob. Her whole day would be ruined if she saw a black dog, a man with a ladder, a pregnant woman, a red-haired child, or a cripple in the morning. Before she opened the money chest, she would spit to the east and west, then to the north and south. When she took out the money, she would spit on the first gold coin she removed and say, multiply and come back. Why do you do that? I asked curiously. To bind it and make it come back. There was a special ceremony when I got up and another when I went to bed. When I went to bed, my mother would put earthen jars of water on small tables at each side of my bed. Then she would bring in two hot coals in an iron skillet and drop one in each jar. As the coals went out with a hiss, she would declaim, May witchcraft be extinguished likewise. Then she would stand by the head of the bed and lament, He's gone, can't you see? He is dead, dead. The swift-winged angels have taken his soul. There's only a shell here, empty and silent. Now, shoo, avant, leave her. Then she would spread a ring of white flour around the bed, but her soul was so full of anxious confusion that the spirits that fed on fear were left inside it. On St. Lucia's day, she would scatter a whole sack full of poppy seeds in front of my door, believing that witches couldn't approach me till they had picked up each individual seed. Poor woman, she could not help me in my condition. In fact, her unintentional black magic attracted the dark forces more than ever. These forces gradually came to control her, for she was afraid and could not understand them. She didn't even know their real names. I pitied my mother with a compassionate, helpless affection. She loved me desperately and blindly, but she had none of the clear, constructive love with which Marietta of Milan had blessed me. Her high-strung, remorseful motherhood finally destroyed her. I would not have dreamed of telling her my secret. She could sense only little of my unusual abilities and disabilities, and this little bit of knowledge drove her to do everything she could think of to appease God and all the devils in hell to keep them from taking me from her. I couldn't even begin to lead her soul out of its destructive maze of superstition. Her inner commands became more and more tyrannical as time went on, forcing her into insane actions. The poor woman's mind was too weak to fight her two worst enemies, her unbridled sexual passions and her rigid, unforgiving Catholicism. Sophie started having visions after my father's death. I tried vainly to explain to her that she formed these visions herself out of her own astral forces and that they were merely the result of her intense fear and remorse. She didn't understand. First, old Pétion appeared one night before she lit the candles. He stood in the dark corridor to the kitchen and wore a long shroud. As she approached, he looked at her forbiddingly, his face saffron yellow. Pray for your sins, he intoned, as though he wouldn't have done better to pray for his own. Then he disappeared. I learned all this after the servants had thrown cold water on her to bring her around. The whole thing made me angry, and I tried to explain to her that the whole phenomenon was caused by her irrational guilt. Oh, be quiet. I, I know. No matter what you say, I know I saw him and he spoke to me and I know he is troubled by my sins. Oh, come on, mother. He ought to be more worried about his own. You've told me how he got his money and how he mistreated my grandmother into an early grave. <gasps> Stop, for God's sake, the dead here if you abuse them and they take revenge. She paled and began the appropriate litany. 
Oh, ye white souls and ye black souls, ye dead who come back, my child is mad, you must not heed his words. He is a poor idiot boy and knows not what he says. Laugh, pity, and avant. I, his mother, will do reverence for him. Yes, I will do everything and more. I couldn't do anything. After old Pétion appeared, she started torturing herself. She would lock herself in her room and beat her naked body. She wore a spiked belt under her robe and fasted until she was her own shadow. She wouldn't even clean up, and nobody ever had more masses said for them than old Pétion did at her expense. But none of this satisfied him. He came to the house more and more frequently and even took to bringing a guest his son-in-law, my father, on an unexpected vacation from hell. The fact that the two men had never known each other in life didn't seem to make any difference. My father did a magnificent job of collaborating with the old man to take the last shreds of my poor mother's sanity. The two of them took over the house and Tozel wasn't satisfied with just that. He had become overbearingly virtuous since being knifed into the next world, and he couldn't get enough of prayers and penances. No matter what his poor widow did, he still threatened her with the fires of hell. He had been repulsive enough as a person, but he was an unusually loathsome ghost. I had to sit by and watch my mother's mind deteriorate as she was haunted by the creatures of her own imagination. But weren't we really in the same boat? I at least knew the names and natures of my rebellious forces, but I had no more power over them than she did over hers. Finally, the intolerable situation erupted. My mother had become a ruin, talking aloud to herself and peering around like a hunted animal under her disheveled hair. She would make gestures to chase small demons off the furniture and complain to me that they were befouling her meals and shouting obscenities during her flagellations. Finally, one morning, she jerked open her door at dawn and ran naked into the street, screaming at the top of her voice. The whole thing happened so suddenly I couldn't stop her. I had to throw on some clothes hastily and follow her. Her screams and the sight of people gaping in windows enabled me to follow her to the church square. I ran as fast as I could and managed to catch up with her on the church steps just as she was about to rush into early mass. She was a truly revolting spectacle, her flesh scarred and gray, and I tried to wrap her in a blanket someone threw me. She started struggling, scratching and biting and hitting me with a whip she used for flagellation. I was exhausted by the time it occurred to someone to help. We finally managed to overpower her and roll her, wriggling like a giant snake, into the blanket. She twisted with the sick strength of the insane and swore and wailed continually. A large crowd followed us back to the house, including the priest and Bayon, the nausea apothecary of whom I shall say more later. Finally, the poor woman calmed down. When we put her to bed, she lay on it rigid with her eyes wide open, and we thought she was dead. We finally found the doctor, who discovered that she still had a faint heartbeat. So my mother had survived, but now her condition was public knowledge, and thus began my hopeless fight against both church and state. The one attributed her condition to the devil and would have exacerbated it with their hocus-pocus. The other simply wanted to lock her up in the Salpêtrière. The state one and my mother, who in the meantime had suffered increasingly severe fits, was bound and taken to the Salpêtrière. The year was 1718.